Welcome to another episode of Talking Metaverse with me, Tan, and I'm joined by Courtney Harding, all the way from New York City. How's it going, Courtney? Going fantastic, thank you. All right, so first, can you give me like one or two sentences on what Friends with Holograms is and what do you do there? Sure, so I'm the founder and Friends with Holograms is a virtual and augmented reality agency. We specialize in creating VR and AR for social impact. That's mostly focused on training. And in the past year and a half, we've also been working more on sort of broader metaverse concepts, mostly focused on how to build a diverse, inclusive and sustainable metaverse. Hmm. So just to understand, you have clients that want to kind of utilize AR, VR experiences for their customers. Yeah, that's correct. That's mostly correct. So what we actually do, a lot of what we do is more on the training side of things. Uh. So it's more these big companies that are trying to train their employees, train their associates, train people in their space to do all sorts of different things. Um, we have done some trainings that are more sort of hard skills. So we did something for like how to fix a part of a data center. We've done things about how to stock a grocery store shelf, like an examine merchandise. So we've done a few of those for clients and those are fine and they're, they're useful. But where we really think it's interesting, where we see the real power of this stuff is soft skills. So we focus a lot on like racial bias, workplace inclusion, mental health, child welfare, like all these different things. And what we do is we create these very realistic scenarios. Um, we shoot in 360 video, we only use real people because we think, you know, that makes much more of an impact having a conversation with a person and not just like a cartoon character or an avatar. And so going on that, we allow people to really experience situations they've never experienced before. So for instance, you in the piece we did on, on uh, workplace inclusion, the user actually is in the position of somebody who's being excluded in the workforce. And it's this very sort of subtle, systematic, mm. over time scenario. And you go in as yourself, right? You don't play a character. You don't put on the headset and it says, now you're this person, now you're that person. You really come as, you know, an employee at a company, which is the audience this is targeted towards. Um, we did another piece on racial bias for a store last year, and it's the same thing. All you know is you're a customer at a store and you are experiencing this incident. And people have really, really strong responses and sometimes very angry, sometimes wow. very upset. And that's good. That's what we really want to accomplish. We don't want people to come out of our experience and be like, oh, that was neat. Like, that was cool. Right. I mean, that's that's nice to hear. But the goal is to make people really aware of these issues and let them feel it, even if it's something wow. they've never felt before. Wow, that's like that's true empathy, right? You're really putting somebody in a situation yeah so this might be a good time to ask you and something i ask all our guests here would you be able to define do you think it's possible to define the metaverse in one sentence yeah the metaverse is people i get asked this question all the time i answer this question like at least once a week i'm on panels i'm on podcasts i'm being interviewed and like it's people right I mean, I can talk about technical specs. I, you know, it's people. It's also to expand on that. It's um, embodied avatars and voice driven. So that's how I define it. I know that's sort of a loose definition. Other people might have tighter definitions. But the division that I really see is between Web 2, which is very text based, video based, and Web 3, which is avatar embodied and voice driven. So people speaking to one another. So that's where I draw the line. That's my definition. I think it's a pretty decent definition. I'm sure other people have different definitions. But to pull it back a little bit, like it's all people. It's all people interacting. It's all communities. The cool thing about the metaverse is there are things we can do that we couldn't do before, right? So I'll give you a really good example. A metaverse experience that I love and you know visited and been part of several times is Black Rock City VR, which is the Burning Man VR experience. And basically, you know, all these Burning Man people built this after Burning Man was canceled due to COVID in 2020. So it's great because it takes all of the good things about Burning Man, the art, the creativity, the community, the interaction, it gets rid of all the bad things about Burning Man, which is it's very expensive to go there. Uh, tickets are hard to get. Everyone smells bad. You're covered in dust by the end of the week, like all of these negative things. And then it adds 
things that you couldn't do before, which is like, you can fly, you know, <laughs> like you can fly around the playa and see everything. Now you couldn't do that unless you were one of the really rich people in a helicopter, I guess, before, right? So it sort of allows you to do all these cool, fun things that you couldn't do as well as enjoying all the best parts of the Burning Man real life experience, which is like the art, the creativity and the community. And so that to me is like a perfect example of how to build a metaverse world. Hmm. So the bummer thing that I see a lot of the time is companies come in and they're too literal, right? If you're a store, I mean, building a store in the metaverse is kind of a neutral. It's like, okay, cool. But like you can fly in the metaverse. So why would I just walk around a store that I could walk around in real life when I could do all these other cool things. So I think that's where people are still trying to figure this stuff out and still trying to suss it out and tr and trying to really focus on this stuff. And I feel like, you know, there are a couple of companies that do it really well and everyone else is kind of still learning. With every new technology, there's always, um, maybe we can call them naysayers, but there's always people who are careful, cautious. So. And I know that you guys have workshops and, you know, you do training. So I was wondering, like, what are some some common misconceptions? So you kind of said, uh, I mean, for me personally, whenever we whenever you mention metaverse to a random person on the street, the response is always something along the lines of why would I want to do that when I love the real world? Do you hear well, this not, a lot? Yeah, but it's not either or. Again, it's an additive. Yeah. Right. So no one, I would not encourage anyone to stop interacting with the re real world. Like that's a bad way to live. But there are things you can do in the metaverse that you can't do in the real world. Right. There's people you can interact with. There's communities you can be part of. There's things you can do. There's experiences you can have, games you can play. They're very immersive. So there's all of these things that you can do on top of everything else in your life in the metaverse. The, you know, like there are people who just don't like technology, which is fine. They're Luddites, like whatever. Um, I find a lot of people are very resistant for reasons they cannot explain. Mm. And that's frustrating. So I'll give you an example. I had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with a very large client. Um, it's a restaurant that's everywhere. And that's all I can say about it. But, you know, you can guess. Anyway, so this <laughs> one woman was just so negative the entire time. But her obsession, her laser focus was on the logistics of headset distribution and mm. every but it was a front because she just didn't she was just like scared of the tech but she didn't want to go into the room and say oh i'm scared of this technology because that's not great so she just kept harping on like well but what about headsets and headset management and i was like here's a headset management tool what about shipping it out well you have a department that ships laptops and smartphones don't you it's just an additional device well what about what about what about and i answered every single objection of hers and I could tell she was getting angry because she wasn't expecting me to be able to like oh you can do this you can do this you can do this you can do because I was breaking down her wall of like fear mm. so finally I, and I regret this a little bit I kind of snapped and I said look lady for 20 years schools in the United States said distance learning could not be done yes. distance learning was undoable great distance example was impossible two years ago Every single public school district in the United States of America, and in fact, many in the world, figured out how to do distance learning in two weeks while people were dropping dead from COVID, right? It's not hard if there's a will, there's a way. And again, that sort of super rapid adoption of distance learning in the US had a lot of pitfalls and people made a lot of mistakes. So I'm not saying like, go out and do the metaverse in two weeks because we don't have that need quite yet. But what I am saying is like, look, this stuff is happening whether you like it or not. It's already happening with young people, right? They're all in Roblox. They're all doing this. So, you know, there's a great the quotes attributed to a bunch of different people. And it, I think I've heard it in like a car ad initially, but it's basically like you either lead, follow, or get out of the way. And in this case, like this woman just needs to get out of the way. Like the stuff is happening. The longer you resist, the harder it's going to be. And do you find that larger corporations, by nature, they're slower to adopt, right? Do you find that smaller clients are more welcoming to new technology? No, no which is what's fascinating to me. So one of the biggest companies to really embrace VR for training is Walmart. I mean, think of, you, you can't think of a bigger company, certainly. You can't think of a company that is 
more kind of old fashioned, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Walmart is like a big chain store. Yep. You know, it's not some cool cutting edge hipster tech brand. It's like a very, very mainstream company. And they've been the earliest adopters or one of the earliest adopters out there. Exxon, same thing, big, huge gas company. I wouldn't consider them cutting edge. They've done a ton of stuff with VR. So it really, it's really funny to me. Like I, you know, I think the natural expectation is these like smaller companies will be more adaptive. But in fact, it's, it seems very random, right? I think it's just, you know, you get a couple of people at a company who are invested in this tech and they are kind of the advocates and the evangelists for it. And then they push it forward. Um, but again, what's always fascinating to me is if you look at Gen Z and, and kids, right? They're going to be entering the workforce in a mm. couple of years at this point. And they are very used to this sort of metaverse space where they're in Roblox and they're, you know, embodied as avatars and they're talking. They're going to get out into the workforce and find it very dated. And the companies that make the investment now are going to be the ones who can keep those Gen Z employees and keep them happy. Mm. Now, you talk a lot about VR. But when we say friends with holograms, I think more AR. So do you have a lot of augmented reality applications in your work or is it mostly VR? It's mostly VR. We have done some AR work, like we did some work for a big soda company a while ago. Um, And now I think what's going to be interesting for us moving forward is how do we mix VR and AR, right? So they were always pretty separate. Now with the launch of the Quest Pro, which is like a pretty amazing headset, we can build things where you go back and forth. So I saw a demo of the Quest Pro a couple weeks ago. I was out at a meta office in California where they gave me a demo. And the demo was for CPR. And you were in a physical room with a physical CPR dummy. There was a digital version of the dummy overlaid over the physical one. An avatar was standing next to you and that avatar could be anywhere in the world and they were the one guiding you through so they could watch everything your avatar did on this digital overlay while you were working on the physical dummy and you know they could see everything that you were doing you could see them guiding you and i mean it was it was still rough and ready right it was just a demo but the concept is fascinating and you know for something like cpr which is more widely accessible to people who want to learn it that's you know that's great it's kind of a nice thing to demo on. But the idea that you could have people like really specialized trainers, training groups of people all over the world is really mind blowing. Like that's where I get excited. So thinking about how do we kind of build some training? Yeah, it does need to be very immersive. You need to be in headset completely blocked out from the world. Some of it you can do through through AR and in the real world, and you can kind of go back and forth. So that's, I think that's really the future. It's going to be, it's going to be this sort of like extended reality, mixed reality world where you're kind of always going back and forth. Hmm. That's exciting. And speaking of the Quest Pro, do you think that's what we need? Some maybe that's not the exact headset, but what we're waiting for for wide adoption is the actual hardware. Do you think that's what we're waiting for? So one of the things we're waiting for for mass adoption. Yeah, I think like the Quest Pro is a really good headset. It is very early. It's very expensive. Yeah. I would not I would not encourage like a late person to get one just because of the cost and it's it's still pretty new. In two or three versions, in two or three years, I think it'll be phenomenal. Um but yeah, I do think eventually it's going to be the type of thing where we ha- have something that's lighter, faster, better and cheaper and that's what's really going to drive the adoption curve up. The other thing that we tend to overlook is the lack of content, right? There is just not that much content built yet. And encouraging more and more people to build content, to experiment, to build content libraries, like that's what's going to be the really big game changer. Because, you know, you can buy a headset and run out of content relatively quickly because there's just not much out there. I think the other thing that we're going to see a lot of improvements in is the sort of work, like workplace metaverse, right? So I know I've gotten excited about like flying and Burning Man and all these fun things. And I think those are amazing. But I do think there's a really strong use case for working in the in the metaverse in your sort of corporate job. So people can meet together, they can work on 3D models together, which I think is fascinating. 
Um, they can collaborate together. They can collaborate all over the world. They can all be feel like they're in physically the same space. So, I mean, I think Horizon Workrooms is a very strong platform. I like Arthur, I like Spatial. Like, there's a lot of interesting platforms and things that people are doing there. And the last place I see a ton of value is in education. Yes. So, so there's a company called Victory XR who I love. I've been working with them for a long time now. They're just the best company with a great founder. And they have programs at all these different universities where students can learn in the metaverse. So they did an experiment um, a couple months ago. And I want to caveat that this is one class at one university with a relatively small group of students. So, you know, I just need to set that out there before I talk about these results because I want to level set. So they divided a class into three groups. The first group learned traditional pre-COVID way, right? They went to class, they did the textbooks, they did everything in person. The second group was on Zoom. So much like we're chatting on Zoom now, they were just on Zoom with a professor. And the third group learned in the metaverse. So, and they did everything, all the, all the homework signs were the same, everything else was the same, just the modality of learning changed. The average grade for in-person at the end of the semester was 78. So that's a C plus, so you know, not, not amazing. The average, interestingly, for Zoom was 82, which is a B minus. Um, that variation I could see just being due to the nature of the students in the class, right? That's, that's a close enough match that I can see like, okay, maybe just a couple of kids who studied a little bit harder were in one group, not the other. The average grade for the metaverse group was a 95. Whoa. Yeah. And That's again, a huge difference. Huge difference. And again, like on one hand, it's, it, it's, it's a small, a small sample, sample size. On the other hand, if you look at all of the research that's come about about training in VR, you see similar types of leaps. You see, you know, 70% performance improvement, 40% more um, retention of information. Like, you see these huge leaps. And so what's kind of interesting to me is when I encounter resistance, I'm like, but why? Because here are the results. Yeah. There's a quote that I think should be the slogan for the metaverse. It's really, I think it might even be Ben Franklin, but I don't know why most people don't talk about this more. You probably know it. Tell me and I may forget. Mm -hmm. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I learn. Well, yeah. Like, and that's so true and so powerful. And that's exactly it, right? Like, and, and here's the best thing about the metaverse too. Failure is free. Yes, so, beautiful. So I did this, so I went to KLM in Amsterdam um, to their offices a couple of years ago. And they've done a lot of stuff in VR, like training for flight attendants and pilots, and it's really, really cool stuff. So I got to go in there and play, have a fun little play date with them in a headset. And I mean, I did the flight attendant training just goofing off, <laughs> right? So I just killed everyone on board like 20 <laughs> times. Oh. But, you know, I was just like having fun, right? I didn't care. But, you know, in fact, if you are actually training to be a flight attendant and taking it seriously, you can make a bunch of mistakes with no cost. So all you do mm -hmm. is reset the sim and go again and again and again. Now, where that gets really interesting is for the in-person training that they were doing, because, you know, if you're an airline, you have to essentially pull flights out of circulation. So pull planes down, put them on the ground and let people train in them. Now you don't have to do that anymore. So what that means for an airline is they have more planes that are up in the air, which means they're making money, right? So it's these kind of like really simple things that add up to these really big cost savings. So that's where I always push back when people like freak out about like, oh, we have to buy headsets. No, we have to make content. I'm like, yes, things cost money. That's how it works. But the cost savings that you realize very quickly are gonna make up for that and yeah. probably then some. All right, before we finish, let me ask you one more question. Um, when all this technology becomes perfected or get closer to perfection, do you think that would discourage us? Why would we choose to meet physically once the metaverse works so well? Do you think there's because a the danger of that? Yeah, there's no danger of that, right? Like human human contact and human interaction is, is its own thing. It's irreplaceable. But what if we can get to a place where we simulate that? Because well, that's happening, we right? With touch and haptics and even, I was talking to somebody recently about smell, that there's gonna be yeah. a way to, so. Oh yeah, OVR, no, they're great. Right. Yeah, no, I've, and I've then, seen a lot so of these things. Touch is happening. I mean, yeah. se seeing and hearing, that's done. 
Yeah. Once we get touch and smell, and I don't know how they're going to do taste, but once we can simulate all of that, uh, so you're not, you have no trepidations. Because I think everyone, like people, like look, we are able to have really great interactions over Zoom, right? And yet, I still go out and meet friends for drinks three to four nights a week, right? We still want to be with other humans. And what I think this does, though, interestingly, is it opens the door for people who don't have that ability. So people in marginalized communities can feel can more freely interface with other people, right? People who have you know illnesses that prevent them from leaving their homes easily, people with disabilities, like they can participate more fully, which I think is very exciting and and fantastic. But I really, truly, unless things get very very advanced, and I don't know that that's going to happen. Like I really don't. I see this as additive, not taking away. So it's just another thing, like. You know, we started in, let's say you start in the 1980s, right? I was born in 1980. So, you know, I had one modality of being with people, which was being with them in person, right? Then I guess I could have the modality of talking to people on the phone. Now, then you add the modality of talking to people on the computer. Then you add the modality of talking to, you know, texting people on your smartphone. And so video chat, like all these different modalities get added. But I still go out with people. I still talk to people on the phone. I still talk to people on Zoom. I still write emails. So it's just like another layer of interaction. But like, I don't think it takes away any of the other layers of interaction. Maybe it takes away video calls, which thank God, um, <laughs> right? That would not be a loss. But I think it just gives us another tool in our toolbox for how we can collaborate and create and be in community. Cool. Courtney, almost out of time. Thank you so much. Um, tell me before you go, what is the next thing you're most excited about like right now at the top of your mind what are you thinking about most oh i'm thinking about the quest pro it's the coolest headset it's again it's very early it's not cheap i want to level set expectations you know don't feel like you have to run out and buy one but they are great but the demos that i saw really blew me away and i think the more we can think about building for headsets like that and getting those out into market the more excited i get Right. So thinking about how do we build really interesting experiences? How do we build interesting experiences that sort of go back and forth between digital and physical? And then also just how do we build community? Right. We're at this very, very early stage in the metaverse. A couple communities have done it really well. Nike does a fantastic job with Roblox, uh, Burning Man VR. There are some like niche communities that are really strong in the metaverse. So how do we build communities? to make people connect and feel included. Because I think that's at the end of the day, what a lot of people are missing still yeah. is that connection, that collaboration, that community. So how do we use this amazing new platform to fulfill that very real human need? Awesome. Great point to end there.